This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast from Advanta IRA, where we show you how to explore investments beyond Wall Street and open your eyes to new options for your portfolio. It's time to take control and give yourself the freedom to choose where you invest your money. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perney, and today we are very pleased to welcome on Jerome Lewis, who is going to be our guest today, talking about interesting ways of doing marketing for for real estate investors on how to increase your sales uh, with some interesting ways on how to use uh, more traditional types of media, namely books, and how to do that. I found it really interesting. I think you all enjoy it too. But first, today on the download, Bed Bath & Beyond is in a little bit of hot water. And yes, I did do that intentionally. I couldn't resist that one of getting the putt in there. Um, Bed Bath & Beyond is getting in a little bit of uh, hot water right now uh, because they are trying to avoid having to file Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Uh, however, they look to be avoiding that with a with a cash for shares uh, exchange with Hudson Bay Capital Management to help stave off having to file Chapter 11. Although it did release SEC filings on Monday of this week, so on 2-6, indicating that they still might not be able to avoid Chapter 11, even with this capital infusion. So it would really be worth to watch to see what exactly is going to happen with their share price. It could be an opportunity to scoop some up really cheap and then potentially sell when they have another round of investors come in, uh, you know, be able to make some quick trades on it. But it also might be something to stay very far away from. Retail has been getting hammered in the past three, four, five, ten years. And then this is just another inclina- indication that people are shifting more and more towards online uh, retailers and the brick and mortar is fading relatively quickly. So again, Bed Bath & Beyond, something to watch out for, but I did find it kind of interesting that they are doing these maneuvers, but are still stating that they are not very optimistic about how well they're going to be protected from having to file bankruptcy in the future. Tech companies are poised in the near future to be getting really hammered with some upcoming legislation. Now, companies such as uh, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Facebook, Alphabet, Google uh, have seen their share prices do pretty well in the past week or so. Now, this is not indicative of how well they've been doing since the beginning of last year with Microsoft seeing an almost 30% slide in their share price since January of 2022. So not to say that this recent uptick has been anything indicative of you know a future trend, but Joe Biden in his State of the Union address on 2-7 Tuesday has indicated that he is renewing calls for bipartisan support in the House and Congress to renew enforcement of antitrust in the big tech sector to help motivate competition in the tech sector as the four main companies of Amazon, Apple, Meta, and Alphabet are really dominating everything with regards to cloud computing, to social media, and uh, hardware and uh, phone sales. So increasing competition ultimately will help to drive the market in better directions with having uh, without having a small cabal of people control these markets. So although these companies have been doing pretty well, it'll be really interesting to see what happens at the opening of trades today on how exactly this is going to pan out. Republicans typically being a little bit more And, you know, take it for what it's worth pro business. But again, it'll be interesting to see how this is going to affect with Republican control taking back most of the House and Senate as to what is actually going to happen. If it's just going to be uh, kind of some, you know, empty words coming out of the president or if there actually is going to get some traction behind it by uh, senators and House of Representatives for some renewed push on antitrust in the tech sector. We're seeing a big cooling off in the coal sector as we've had a milder than anticipated uh, sp- uh, winter and sp- winter and spring in the world. Uh, we are seeing supplies surge and demand slump, causing the supply surpluses to exceed 2020 levels. Uh, with another year of worsening prices expected, the prop up that we have seen over the past two years of coal uh, is expected to be almost completely wiped out. So individuals that are investing into energy products that are heavily invested into coal might want to look at a rebalance play here in the near future. However, anything in this energy sector has been extremely volatile as of late, and we're not necessarily seeing any appreciable gain or rise from renewables, nuclear, or oil and gas companies at present. It's all kind of just in one large state of flux. So coal definitely seeing some some very hard times ahead, but is there really another play to be made in 
the energy sector, it's kind of hard to tell. Inflation is continuing to cool in the U.S. with more indexes showing small and marginal improvements that we can still and hopefully that means we can still see Jerome Powell's prediction of inflation of interest rate hikes ending by mid-May. That would be fantastic news for anyone trying to buy a new home. And going into ending the download segment, we're seeing some good news from the national home builder, D.R. Horton. In January's earning call with shareholders, they stated they are seeing an increase in home buyer demand and a decrease of cancellation of contracts for the first time in 10 months. So some good news out of the housing market. Hopefully we can see some... Purchases increasing, some inventory increasing, and some general health in the market starting to rein back in. So again, something definitely to watch and see, but hopefully these inflationary measures of the Fed continuing to raise interest rates and then starting to cool those off will have the desired effect of decreasing inflation and helping to stimulate markets here in the future. This has been The Download. What is what is a liquid CD? Liquid CDs allow you to make withdrawals before the maturity date, but not without providing the institution with advance notice. It is not as simple as making a withdrawal from a checking account, however. Some banks or credit unions require a week's notice, while others need as much as 30 days. In many cases, there is also an initial lockup period. You can't make a withdrawal in the first week of the fund that prevents this kind of day trading and behavior that, pre- that is prevalent in the stock market. A liquid certificate of deposit is mainly defined as a type of CD that allows you to make withdrawals without incurring a penalty, however. The funds are that are in the account are accessible throughout the lifetime of the product, unlike most traditional CDs, which apply a hefty penalty fee for withdrawing early, reducing the interest earned on that profit. However, investors can't have their CDs and ta- can't have their cake and eat it too. Liquid CDs generally offer lower rates than traditional CDs, meaning that they sacrifice yield for flexibility. This is a liquid CD, and this has been what is. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perny. Today, we are very pleased to welcome Jerome Lewis with us today. We're going to be digging into uh, effective marketing for real estate and real estate investors. So uh, it's something that we certainly haven't covered on this podcast before. But if it, if anyone has ever tried to sell a piece of real estate, you know you inherently have to market it. You have to get out there and let people know what you got going on. And marketing is something that kind of goes hand in hand with uh, any real estate investor when, uh, when you're trying to make uh, an effective play on your investing strategy. So Jerome, thank you very much for being with us today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, how did you get started in this? Uh, you know, where do you come from and and the things uh, associated with it? Sure thing. Thank you, Alex, for having me. And I want to thank uh, Corey for suggesting me on the podcast. Now, a little bit about myself. I got started in real estate about six or seven years ago. And I had a job. I was in like corporate America. And I was like, this is not working. I want to try to, um, I want to, look for financial freedom. I went online and I typed that in financial freedom, how to be better, how to make more money. And I came across the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Came across that book. And one of the things that they kept suggesting within that book was to get involved in real estate. So I was like, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get involved in real estate. I read everything that I could about real estate, went on bigger pockets, joined a bunch of meetups. And I eventually had all the information that I needed, but I wasn't acting on the information. So I was like, all right, what's the next step? And I believe I read that book again. And he, Kiyosaki talked about the importance of getting a coach and a mentor. So I went out a second time and I found me a coach and a mentor. At the time, that coach was offering like free information. And he had he had a coaching program. And I was like, you know what? I'm interested in his coaching program. He's He was providing a lot of great information. And he hit me with the price. He told me the price of his coaching was $3,000. And at the time, that was a lot of money for me. So I was, my journey pretty much stopped for two years because I had to save up the money to to reach the $3,000. Eventually, I saved up for those two years or so. And I got back involved with that real estate coach. And he taught me what is called how to wholesale in real estate. I learned how to wholesale. And one of the things that I used to always hear people say, you're not in the wholesaling game, you're in the marketing game. And I never understood what that mean, even till like maybe about a year ago now, I never really understood what that mean. But I learned how to wholesale. I built the real estate business. I built an entire cold call center. And I did not know that I was marketing the entire time. 
I eventually moved on to like other things and I would show up to my local RIA. I know Corey is a big fan of local RIAs. I would show up there and while I was wholesaling, I wanted to offer deals. The local, the RIA leaders, they would see me show up consistently. So one time they asked me to be involved um, and volunteer for their board to help with the technology. One thing I forgot to mention is that I was a, uh, I was, when I was working, I was involved in IT. So it was naturally, it was natural for me to help them with their IT services. I helped them with their technology. And then they eventually elected me to the board of directors to help with the technology. And they were having troubles with marketing. They asked me to get involved. We had a bunch of issues around marketing. They didn't want to spend like money because they couldn't justify the expenses. And that's where I was like, you know what, I'm going to go learn how to effectively market and teach people how they can market without being tight on budgets. That's how I got involved in real estate marketing. Awesome. Great. So you kind of, you know, you have your, you know, general start in real estate marketing by wanting to get involved in wholesaling. Uh, now explain this a little bit about, you know, your journey getting started in wholesaling. You know, most people, when they get started in wholesaling, it's not just a, uh, you know, a linear path of saying, oh, I'm having great success with it. Tell us a few, you know, if you would about a few of your, you know, uh, you know, learning learning steps along the way when it came to uh, investing and uh, getting started in wholesaling and how you discovered that, you know, marketing was a key component of that. Absolutely. So I had the the mentor that I had at the time, he was, um, he would use like Ron LeGrand's um, principles. And I didn't under, I didn't really know who Ron LeGrand was at the time, but he taught me this concept called the 100 house rule. And the 100 house rule is a rule. It's a concept where you have to go through 100 leads just for you to get one deal. So we would go out and we would pound the pavements and we would do all of this. What I, I didn't know at the time, I just knew what I was working. We would do all of this marketing. We would do cold calls, direct mail, yellow letters. We did all of these different strategies. And I'm an introvert. So I was working at IT and I was like, you know what? This stuff is like really whooping my behind. How can I find another way to do this stuff without being exhausted? So naturally, I, I, um, I eventually, the, the, the tenure with that coach was about three months. After that three months mm -hmm. and pounding a payment, I was like, you know what? I want to still do this business because I had success, but I don't want to do it that way. I don't want to use the old school methods. I didn't want to deviate from what the mentor taught me taught me at the time. But once I finished, I was like, you know what? I want to do this in another way. And I went out to learn. Um, I wanted to collect leads and I was like, how can I do this online? So naturally, I like gravitated towards, I gravitated towards Facebook and I started to learn Facebook advertising and I started to gain traction and pick up leads using Facebook. Um, when I was working with that mentor, cause I know I, I like geared off a little bit. When I was working with that mentor, he's taught me that hundred house rule. And it took me probably about 200 deals in order for me to get one closed deal. My first closed deal in wholesaling was $20,000. I remember it and I was very happy with it, but I didn't appreciate all of the work that I had done to earn that $20,000. So that's how I got started. We ran through a lot of leads. We had a lot of conversations with sellers and a lot of people just were not interested in the prices that we were offering them. And that that's the story there. <laughs> gotcha. Um, hold on one second. For whatever reason, my computer screen just went completely blank, but I'm assuming you can still see me, right? I, I do see you. Yeah. So like, let me, let me, I'm going to try to close my clamshell here and see if it comes back on. Um, this is an inopportune time to have a <laughs> technology issue, but let me just try to figure this out real quick. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right, great. Yeah, it was. I just I I didn't want us to get through this whole thing, and then my computer completely crashed, and and we have that problem. Okay, so you had to go through about two hundred leads, um, you know, to kind of get there, and that's obviously you know a difficult task. You know, you kind of, uh, but with anything, and especially investing, you know, whatever someone tells you one thing, you can probably have to probably double your effort. Um, you know, if if you can pretty much assume that whatever anyone tells you, you can probably have to expect to do double that in order to get the you know particular 
you know, end result that you're looking for. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of go through that, you know, you go through, you know, you thought it was going to be a hundred, you got to 200. So after you get that kind of your first deal, um, you know, done and closed, you know, that's obviously a big milestone, but, you know, obviously, you know, from your, from your point of view, thinking that, oh, well, I had to do, you know, twice as much work. Did you find that discouraging all, or, you know, what did you, what would you say were some of the things that you kind of learned from that first foray into it? Okay. You know, you go through, wow, this was twice as much work as I thought. Did you still feel that it was going to be a worthwhile mm -hmm. effort or, um, you know, what are some things, you know, after you accomplished that, that you thought, Hey, you know, you know, were, were there any kind of, let's say misgivings or did you say, okay, great. I, I did this, you know, it took me twice as much work to do it. Um, you know, where there's something saying, okay, you know, I know how I can be more effective with this. And that's probably kind of where you started to think, you know, okay, you know, my marketing is probably what needs to improve in this area. So, you know, going from that first deal that you finally got, once you've, you know, obviously, you know, you wanted to be more financially free, you, you got with the mentor, you found the wholesaling um, avenue was probably what you wanted to go with. And then now you finally done your first deal, you know, what are the things that you learned from that? And then how did you become more effective afterwards? So, my mindset on doing the deal was, okay, this works, but do I want to constantly do this? And at the time, the job that I was working, the job wasn't a bad job. I just wasn't fully appreciated at the job. So my mindset was like, if if I if I'm not appreciated here, maybe I'll be appreciated in my own business when I go start my own thing. And I I wanted to start a business, but I didn't want to continue that pounding the pavement is what I is what I called it. So um, naturally, I'm in IT. I'm like, how can I use a computer to do these things and gain some business? I went out, I purchased like a few Facebook ads course, and I started applying these concepts towards Facebook ads. I still did not understand what I was doing at the time. I'm like, I'm an IT guy. This is just computers. You're clicking, dragging, dropping. You're just inputting information. I did. I had no idea that I was marketing, but I built an entire, I built a a successful business, right? I built a cold call center and I had people, I had um, VAs from across seas. They were bringing in leads and I was closing those deals consistently. Um, I, I wasn't like super ambitious. I didn't want to conquer the world. I only wanted to do like one deal per month. And that's what we did. Um, eventually I hit that block where you have to manage people and it becomes a little exhausting. I was like, you know what, this is not, I don't like this either. How can I find another way to do this? And um, I, I went out and I started to rebuild my business around just Facebook ads and just me marketing and not having to manage those cold call uh, virtual assistants. Okay, gotcha. So now when you say that you had, you know, built this up with virtual assistants, how were you capturing your leads at that point? Um, you know, was it just again, you know, finding the leads is kind of the you know, the big bulk of it. So how were you kind of capturing that stuff in that, you know, initial foray when you said, okay, you did your first deal, you got things kind of up, you know, ramped to scale. And now you're, you know, getting that goal of one per month, you know, that's still, you know, I'd say probably, you know, that's, you know, if you have a hundred leads, that's 2,400 leads in a year you have to have roughly in order to get that, you know, one deal per month. So how are you getting that volume of leads to follow up on when you were doing this portion of your business? So, a bulk of it was Facebook ads. I would use a variety of strategies. Again, it was like scattered, but most of it was Facebook advertising. And all of the leads, they came in, like at the time, you were even allowed to like target um, sellers by zip code. Now it's like a lot more stringent, but I did just primarily Facebook ads. The leads would come in, they would fill out their, their information. Not all of them called back. Not all of them were happy with prices, but a bulk of it was Facebook ads. And um Eventually, like I, I would always be involved in REAs, but eventually I got called by uh, one local REA to ask me to teach those strategies and, uh, you know, the rest is history kind of. Now, way. when, now approximately like what time frame was this? Was this back in like 14, 15? Like when, just so people can kind of understand the market that you were getting through in this stuff. What, 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 uh, what years was this that you were doing this stuff? I would say about... <laughs> Like you said, 2016. So it's about seven years ago when I first started. So probably from about 2017 to about 2019 okay, is when yeah. I was doing this. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, from my experience in in investing, that was definitely a much 
different time than we are in now for wholesaling. Um, you know, there were the the amount of leads you can gather back then is significantly more than what is right now, just for the fact that you know the <clears throat> the spread on wholesaling was much fatter than it is right now. You know, it's it's getting really thin on the wholesaling side mm -hmm. right now. It's getting better. You know, as prices are coming down, you know, there's more demand for people, you know, wanting to sell inventories rising. So you have that, you know, uptick in you know, the viability of, of running a wholesale strategy now than you did, um, you know, maybe last year or two years ago. Uh, so, so cool. So now that we kind of have an understanding of, you know, where you came from, you know, you got to the portion of the business where you say, okay, you know, the human capital side is not something I want to do. And, and it takes a certain, a special kind of person to really want to manage human capital. That's not me. Um, you know, I, I love talking to people. I've been in sales for, you know, the past, you know, five years or so. And, um, you know, I, I, I enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy the, the operational side of things too, but, um, you know, hats off to my friends and, 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 and peers that can do the human capital management side of it. It's not me either. So I can, I can definitely, um, you know, kind of empathize with you on that. So you got to the point where you scaled your business. Um, you know, now you're kind of asked, asked to, you know, start teaching, you know, these strategies. So where do you kind of transition at that point? Um, you know, kind of, you know, getting down the pathway of what you're doing now, you know, what does that inflection look like uh, from the point that you make that decision of saying, Hey, you know what, the, the management of all this is getting just to the point where I don't really feel like I want to do this particular strategy at the time. Yeah, so I was uh, part of, because I was elected to the board of my local RIA, we had this uh, bigger group of RIAs, and that group was called RMD, it was called the RIA Mastermind Group, and I was participating in that group, and one of the leaders invited me to, she was like, you know you're going to do a speech for us, right? Because I would speak up and I would give suggestions. Uh, for a long time, I was very quiet, but then I would eventually I start to learn stuff. I would speak up and give suggestions. And uh, her, her name's Vina, Vina Jones-Cox. She was like, Jerome, I'm going to have you speak for my group. And I was like, why am I going to speak for your group? I don't do anything other than just do Facebook ads. I'm, I'm like, I don't have any presentation or anything like that. And she put the pressure on me, which I, I absolutely appreciate. She was like, you just show what you do. I was like, okay, that's easy because I already show what I do. So she invited me to do that and I presented to those groups. One of the things I, I um, realized like in teaching like those groups is that like I was I was showing people everything like how do you do this how do you do this I was showing them everything how and people would go and try to implement th those things themselves and it wouldn't work effectively so I was I wanted to I was, it's like how can I show people how to do this without wasting their money and uh, do it in a way that's effective so they can get started and begin to gradually succeed Great. So what are some of those, you know, strategies of saying, okay, you know, what's the most effective use of not only your, you know, human capital in time, but also, you know, your monetary capital in dollars and cents that you're outputting. So, you know, if someone is, you know, kind of, you know, sitting there in the, you know, sitting there in the in the class listening to you speak about that what are some things that you, you know, initially tried to, you know, convey to people and has that changed over time? Yeah, it, it has changed over time. One of the things I would try to convey to people is that like marketing is not uh, it's not something that you do and then you, it's, it's not a slot machine. You don't just put money in and then the money comes out. Like there's a science and there's technology, there's techniques that you have to use behind it. And while I was teaching or showing people these things, a lot of times like the most common thing that would come up with all marketing overall was people didn't have budgets or they didn't have money that they wanted to just spend and kind of waste in a way. They didn't want to test things. They wanted things to work instantly. And I was like, how can we show people that uh, this is testing or how can we come up with a strategy that allows them to spend money without wasting it? Okay. So that's a really good point because I don't understand, you know, past just, you know, putting something on a billboard or kind of just like putting something in front of someone, if you will. I don't know how you know, marketing works past just, you know, trying to get the, you know, impressions on people that you have something that is of value to them, whether that is, you know, selling a better sponge than they have in their kitchen right now, or whether it's selling a new car or, you know, the benefit of a self-directed IRA or a wholesale deal. So, you know, what, again, are, how would you say that, people, at least in the real estate realm, and probably, you know, obviously, th at this point, you're still focusing on helping people uh, improve wholesaling businesses. Is that correct? Was it focused on that? That was my strategy. And that was my focus, but you could apply it across the board. 
Okay, so let's just kind of, you know, keep it focused on this because, again, you know, the impression, you know, measurement is probably different from from other, you know, depending on what market you're in. At least what we're looking at with regard to real estate, what are some measurable things that people can say, okay, you know, it's it's easy enough for us to look at it and say, okay, you know, I spend money on a Facebook ad and I spend money on direct mail. How do you, what are some ways that people measure that? Um, you know, I'm sure people that are listening to this would want to know, but personally, I'd like to know. I like to learn something from these interviews as well. So how do you gauge engagement and and measure, you know, effectively saying, okay, you know, what am I getting for the dollars spent on this? So there's like a couple of ways that we can answer that. And it's, it's it's tricky because it will vary on the market. It will vary on the marketing strategy. All of those things play a factor. So that's why I was like, how can I help people understand that they don't have to waste money? And that's what I came up. That's how I came up with like the, the book marketing strategy. When I told people, I was like, look, this is what I invest, right? It's an investment. I will also tell you, your marketing is an investment. And at the time I was teaching people, you want to do $50 per day to invest in your leads in Facebook. And as long as you get one deal that, that came out to about $1,500, dollars per month as long as you get one deal your advertising pays for itself but 15 50 dollars a day was still a bit much for people so i was like it, it was my job to help people come up with a strategy on like how to invest money and get an immediate return on that money and um the, the, the thing that really like really drove it home was i was helping out that local ria and we had spent at the time like a, before i became a board member they had spent about $5,000 per month on marketing and they didn't get any return from that $5,000. So they were a little bit scarred and traumatized from investing money in marketing. And this is this is what commonly happens with people. They invest money in marketing and they don't get a return on their marketing because they don't have a way to track or investigate what that mar what the marketing dollars are doing. Okay. Now, how exactly, what, what are some kind of ways that you can track that specifically? Uh, yeah, is it so, just like, is it just input of leads? Is it, you know, reach outs? Like, what are some ways that people can say, okay, you know, I spent this $5,000 or in your case, almost 18, you know, your, your metric is roughly $18,000 a year. You know, how do I track that necessarily to say, okay, you know, I, I dropped this 18 grand now, what am I getting out of it? Yeah. So, and when I used to like a lot of digital strategies and when you use like digital strategies, especially Facebook and Google, they have like automatic dashboards that you can view and check out and see where your money is going and see like how many leads or what's coming in. Okay, <clears throat> great. Now, you know, going forward from there, you mentioned, um, you know, some stuff that you have, again, kind of implemented that have been a little bit interesting. And I know you have, you mentioned to me, you know, it's again, writing a book, which is something is that I never really would have thought of, you know, past just the fact that I enjoy reading. Um, you know, I never really would have thought of as kind of an interesting thing past just, you know, putting out information, but as far as marketing and lead generation can also be effective um, as well. So, you know, at this point, had you kind of when did when did that kind of become a factor in your strategies um, or was this like is this something just really recently um you know or when did that kind of play in and, and how does that exactly work so that played in about three years ago and that ria group that i'm mentioning they uh they were again traumatized because they didn't want to pay for marketing but it's like in order for you to have successful marketing you got to be like willing to play, pay um they didn't want to pay. So I'm like, how can people find a way to pay for their marketing without wasting it? That was my constant question. How can someone pay for marketing without wasting it? Um, and how can you get like prospects or customers invested in like what it is that you're offering without, with, um, so, so they are considered more serious leads. And that's when I decided to sign up for a coaching program about marketing. And they taught me that, that Magnetic marketing. They taught me the importance of having a book because you can do so many things with utilizing that book. And I eventually, uh, I, I teach like I have a class where I teach students like weekly. I eventually, like I was like really huge on video marketing. And in my Facebook ad strategy, I didn't mention like I would use a lot of video marketing, and I would encourage people to do business with me over video. So once I learned about the importance of having a book within uh, their coaching program, I was like, you know what, how can I write a book as fast as possible? And I, um, one of the suggestions was like to transcribe your audio. 
And that's why I was like, you know what? I have a bunch of audios. I have a bunch of trainings where I already teach these strategies to people. So how about I take one of those video strategies and I transcribe it and put it into a book? Okay, cool. So now, again, I, I'm just kind of, you know, lost on, you know, how exactly that plays into marketing past just telling people, hey, you know, I wrote a book, what it really is, you know, the inherent benefit besides, you know, just content of, you know, writing a book, you know, how does that affect what what exactly, you know, do you feel is the effect that it is a benefit to a marketing strategy um, that differs from just maybe, you know, putting out a Facebook ad or doing something in print or direct mail? What is that differentiator and how, you know, effective has it really been? So uh, less than, so it, it's a lot of strategies. I get really excited about it. One of the things is like less than 1% of the population ever publish books. A lot of times we think that we have to publish a book about, you know, our lives and who we are, but you got fiction, you got nonfiction. And the objective is uh, you, you want to, you create these books around your authority or your expertise, and you can use them in several different ways. And one of the main strategies that you use it is you go and you sell that book. So you sell that book, you sell it online. Like, so no, no longer am I saying, hey, come do business with me as a real estate uh, and I'll buy your house. Now I'm saying, this is how to sell your house and work with investors in a way that makes sense for you. Or this is how you list your house for the best price possible. And the cool thing that's happening when I post this book or I'm selling this book is that these leads, in theory, they're paying for their own marketing. So a good example is I, I write my book and I sell it for $10. Now, if I sell five of those books at $10, that means I can reinvest that $10 budget back into my marketing and my marketing becomes uh, more powerful, more potent. I have a paid advertising budget that I can now use to put into my marketing. Okay. So, so are you looking at this more from a revenue generation standpoint, or is it also a lead capture um, avenue or is it kind of a blend of both? So it is it is a blend of both the the but the objective is not to um, the main objective is not to generate revenue. The main objective is to generate that revenue so you can reinvest it back into the business because we're in real estate and it's a high ticket item. We don't need to make ten, twenty dollars off that book. We want to get the leads. So these people are paying for the book or they're paying for the leads to get on your list and you can then remarket to those leads, right? And we're talking about like all online, all online strategies, but if they pay for that book and they, they, you, they pay for that book, now you collect all of their information, right? So one of the hardest things to do is collect people's information. But if they start to pay for a book, a physical book, you have their address and you can then follow up with them and you can follow up with them via direct mail and different strategies. Okay. So what are some of those strategies um, that you get from that lead capture that you found effective um, for, for real estate investors? Because that's, that's interesting. So it, well, I get, let's back up I'm getting kind of ahead of myself. So this, you know, when you say writing a book, I'm assuming that it is a, a digital ebook or did you also go print? It is a combination of both. It is digital and it is also print. So the main thing that we do, and I used to do, I used to make the same mistake too, is like we're in a digital age and we get uh, we get a little lazy. Like direct mail is one of the most effective ways that you can market to people because there's so much noise online. When you hit somebody in the mailbox, they sit down, they pay attention to what it is that you're sending them. So I, I and, my, and our strategies, I make sure that they get a digital copy, right? To, um, to cure like their instant gratification but I also send them the physical copy in the mail. To further what you what you asked me is my favorite strategy to like kind of follow up, right? Because the most important thing that you can do with these leads is once they generate interest, you still have to follow up. And we fail to follow up. That's one of the most common things that we do in the business. We fail to follow up. So my favorite strategy for following up is to provide that customer prospect with a monthly newsletter. So they've come in, they've per purchase your book, right? And this is all, this is digital as well as physical. They've come in, they've purchased your book, and now they're on your list. And you can send them a monthly newsletter ex emphasizing tips, strategies, and ways that they can work with you or whatever it is, whatever kind of way that you want to add them value. That's 12 ways to follow up. And in a way, uh, newsletters cost $2 or so to print, right? They, they purchased a book for $20 as an example. And the newsletter costs $2 to print. That's maybe a, uh, I can't do the math, but that's like less than a $50 investment and they're paying for their own marketing in a way. Uh, one of the things that I failed to mention is like, you don't only sell the book. 
you sell the book and you can offer them other strategies, right? So you got down sales and up sales, cross sales. So they could come in, right? A typical funnel that we have set up, they come in, they purchase the book. Then we offer them a webinar and a masterclass for an extra $47 or so. We offer them templates and other stuff and they get into your lead funnel and they start to pay for their own marketing advertising in a way because they purchased that book. Uh, one of the things that's really cool about a book is, is that is a, it is a very low pressure. Everybody knows what a book is. They don't know what it is to have a consultation with you. They don't know what it is to have a conversation with you. They're scared to do these things, but they know what a book is. So they're willing to pay for that book and people don't, they're not scared if they pay $20 for a book and it didn't pay off. Right. So. Okay. <clears throat> so effectively it's, you know, bringing people in and then now what was this book centered on? Was it centered on like effective wholesale strategies? Um, was it, was it on like, what exactly was the content of the book? And I think that kind of will answer the question in my head of like, okay, so this is, you know, yeah. So what was the content of the book specifically that you wrote? Cause you know, that's all. So no. I have uh, like, I have a variety of books depending on what problems or what avatar that I'm trying to serve. And whenever I'm dealing with home sellers, that book is about how to sell your house and how to work with investors in a way that makes sense. So a good example would be, let's just say like I, Ivana, like they, they do like webinars, they could create a book around, um, investing a retirement account. And it doesn't have to be a long book. It could be a, a short book. It could be five tips, five strategies. But what the key principle is like everybody sends out eBooks. So you go somewhere, find a fake email address and have them send your email address. But the, the, to take it to the next level and to turn that thing into an actual physical book that you can send to prospects in the mail and you can follow up with them in the mail a little bit later. So the book can be around any strategy depending on what you're trying to achieve. It's just informational, just like you do uh, the podcast and the, the biweekly calls. Like you could turn those things into book strategies. You could transcribe all of that, put it into a book and you can start using that as a marketing asset to bring people onto your list. Okay, so as far as the strategy for writing a book, so you, so I guess kind of it's it's twofold for the for the reason that you would do something like that is that you need to identify you know what you're trying to accomplish and then write, um, you know, copy against you know what it is that you know people would find a benefit to have them kind of funnel into being a lead for you. So it's you know that kind of engagement aspect, you know, just like you said, like doing a webinar, doing a podcast. Um, you know, it's that additional point of engagement that can also double as a lead capture source uh, because, you know, it's, you know, with a podcast, you know, it's great, but the, it, you know, the measurable metric is, you know, the views and engagement. And then hopefully, you know, we captured that as, you know, someone coming back saying, hey, I found this interesting, let's learn more. So it's a little bit harder to kind of gauge. It's not kind of an immediate lead generation. It's more of kind of a marketing exposure. But the book, at least from what I'm gathering from this, is that if you write something, you know, within its specific engagement point, then that is how you can kind of, you know, really hyper focus the lead generation, if you will, to kind of, you know, again, you know, bring up the quality of leads and also increase the quantity of them as well. Absolutely. And... One of my favorite strategies is like a, in my book is called like the, the my book is called like real estate marketing implementation. So once you have an idea of what it is that you're trying to achieve, you can like you can do so much with it. It's up to you uh, to become the expert or establish yourself as the authority. So at the end of my book, I, I wrote I, I can't remember how exactly how many chapters, but I wrote the basis of the book. And then towards the end of the book. I put a bonus chapter in there and that bonus chapter is a podcast episode. It's just a podcast episode where, where I'm with one of my mentors and I'm like, Hey, could you give me some tips on how to think about marketing? And I just took that podcast episode, episode transcribed it and I put it inside of that book and it gave more value to that book. So. Okay. Gotcha. So what are some, what were kind of some of the, the hardest things that you found regarding, you know, writing a book? I said, you know, you said you transcribed it. Uh, you know, was there, you know, any initial kind of, you know, learning curve that that you had when it came to this particular strategy that you found difficult that you think other people might benefit from kind of, hey, you know, here's the here's the pothole on the road, you know, take a left, avoid this, you know, there's a dead end here, you know, what were some kind of salient points regarding, you know, that particular strategy? Because again, that's kind of a new one that I haven't seen a whole lot of people granted, you know, there are plenty out there, but, um, you know, if you were to compare people that market exclusively on Facebook ads, 
uh, or Instagram or anything else like that compared to them to people that have written a book and go, your strategy, uh, y- that is a definite, much, much smaller minority of the people that have written a book versus people that kind of go um, your initial route with the Facebook and the digital ad space um, and also direct mail. So, you know, what are some kind of learning curve items that people can avoid or just interesting things maybe maybe that you learned along the way that you didn't expect to learn um, when it went to, uh, you know, writing something um, as old school as a book? Sure. I, I would say that uh, the biggest thing is like time efficiency. Like a lot of us believe that we don't have time. And if we like utilize like the correct strategy and we get out of the, like the the biggest mistake that I see people make is they actually go and try to type the book. That is a huge mistake because once you create your content, you get your manuscripts back and everything like that, you're going to end up editing it. You're going to be doing a lot of typing anyway. So please, like if there's anything you do, don't try to type that book. I've uh, had like se- several successful clients and students. And uh, then I've got like a few that didn't work. And all of the ones that tried to type it out, they failed. So the what I like to do, what I typically encourage my students to do is we come up with, and it doesn't, the other thing is the book doesn't have to be long. So I come up with a framework of how to write this book. And the way you do that is like, I, I like to start people off because a lot of times they're struggling with like, how can I like make videos? I'm scared to be on camera. I don't want to do that. So the framework is generally like, I want you to just get comfortable doing video, right? I want you to go out and I want you to create a video and I want you to introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, what your expertise is. Everybody can talk about themselves on camera. And that kind of breaks the uncomfortability of being on camera and doing video. Now, what is your level of expertise? What are you an expert about? So I want you to create five questions on top on a topic that you're an expert about. And then the last thing is I want you to come up with like, how can somebody work with you or what should they do to reach out to you? So it's a it's a structure of seven videos. Once you have those seven videos, you can then turn those, those seven videos into a transcript and you can put it inside of a book. Um, the reason why I, I highly, highly encourage video also is because once you've done those videos, you can then take those videos and you can call them a mini course and you can use that as an upsell inside of your book funnel that you can sell to the customers and prospects. No, that's really cool. Yeah. I never, <clears throat> never really would have thought that, you know, kind of the um, kind of the cross pollination of two different avenues would really work to that benefit. Um, and now, I mean, granted beta is closed, but you could plug those seven videos into chat GPT and have them spit out a book for you. I'd be interested to see uh, if anything would coherently come out of that. Um, I mean, it's, I, I played around with it a little bit and it's, frighteningly interesting technology um do you, well, I, to that point um that's really interesting do you see I, I think you know let's 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 talk about you know kind of rounding the corner coming coming home with this and things that that can be seen in the future um you know do you see marketing by you know machine learning and ai being something that would be an effective implementation in the future uh for this stuff or do you think that the human touch is going to really kind of still be something that is needed uh in this because uh, you know, I don't know if you've played around with uh, chat GPT or not, but it's pretty interesting stuff. And it can, you know, the the way that things are going, um, you know, leaning again more on technology uh, has le- could potentially yield some interesting results. It can. And it, uh, this topic comes up all the time. I talk about tech. I talk about marketing. And I, it is my understanding. I know technology very well because I like did IT and I'm not saying that I'm, at, uh, I'm right always, but we're going to always need human touch. And I appreciate technology and I appreciate how technology advances. And I also appreciate how it scares us a little bit because that forces us to become more human and do things that computers can't do. So we gotta be more creative and we gotta be more human. There will always be an appreciation for the human aspect. A a good example is when 2020, when the pandemic came, uh, we all were yearning for that in-person social connection and computers and technology it just doesn't give us those things so technology ai is just a companion tool for us we still need that human aspect there are going to be so a good example you mentioned like chat gpt so uh it's going to get more advanced and everybody's going to be able to jump onto chat gpt and say do this thing for me everybody's going to be able to do that and one of the key factors of marketing is separating yourself what's different about you and a big reason why i encourage people to do video is because it shows you as a human it builds that human connection and that's one of the things that separate us as people 
we're all different. We all have different personalities. Some people will like us, some people won't, but that's the, that's one of the key factors that helps you stand out and be different than other people and be human. So I think kind of what you've, you know, a general theme on your strategy, at least, is that differentiation factor of saying, hey, you know, here's what everyone else is doing, you know, do something else that is effective, that is not done by as many people, you know, you don't have to find something that no one else does, you know, I think that's kind of a, probably a pipe dream for a lot of people, you know, you don't have to be the innovator, be like, hey, I'm the only one that does X you're not going to be that guy, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. But, you know, if you can do something that's different, you know, anyone can go on Facebook and, you know, give them, you know, $50, $100 a day and say, hey, market X, here's my flyer, push this to these type of people, here's my here's my target. Uh, but, you know, not everyone writes a book. Not everyone has, you know, again, those seven videos that you kind of put together, you know, and, you know, not everyone has that differentiation. And to your point about things like, you know, AI and what's going to be, um, you know, effective, you know, if everyone goes that route, you know, everyone's going to kind of get tunnel visioned in. And if, you know, one people or a minority of people is doing, you know, something a little bit different, that's always going to get eyes on people because people are going to get that atrophy of, you know, always having, you know, that that one thing that's being pushed in. They're always going to look for something a little different. You know, not every single person goes to McDonald's. You know, you want to go and get some Thai food. You want to get some Indian food. You know, you want that, you know, differentiation in your life. And I think that, you know, if I'm hearing you correctly, that is something that, is maybe kind of a measurable, you know, easily easily attainable concept for people when they think about marketing and real estate. Would you would you agree with that, or would you want to add something to that? I, I agree one hundred percent, and uh, I just want to emphasize, like you said, be different, do things differently than everybody else. Uh, you don't have to be like you don't have to do what nobody else is doing. Be like part of the minority, like stand out a little bit. Uh, we understand that generally the minority are the people that succeed. So when I started off, when I was talking to you, I, I mentioned like less than 1% of the population actually go through and publish books. And by you going out and publishing the book, you start to separate yourself already and put yourself in a top minority of people that actually did publish the book. Because what is that command? That means you sat down, you took your time and your expertise and you put it into a book and you put it into an asset. Like nobody that's not serious is, is, is going to sit down and write a book. Like people that are writing books are serious. They're committed on their subject, on the subject that they're writing about or publishing about. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also something that I would find interesting, at least from the quality of the lead standpoint, do you find that after you uh, went the route and started marketing and writing books that the quality of your leads increased? Because I would, I, and again, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here that it would wait you to guess that someone that is willing to write or sorry, that someone that is willing to buy a book is kind of already of the assumption of saying, hey, I am committed enough to sit down with my time and read through the pages. You know, it's easy to buy an ebook, stick the PDF on your desktop, not read it, you know, kind of tune out, you know, you got your kids running around, you walk your dog, you don't really listen to the audiobook um, or, you know, the podcast or whatever. Do you find that it has been more beneficial for the types of leads that you generate? Are they better quality or is it just, again, a kind of a, a net a net positive of just getting more of them out there, getting more exposure, getting more leads in for you. So I, uh, one of the things that I, I, I want to mention that I didn't mention earlier is that one of the other really cool benefits about a book is that it's like, it's, it's a marketing asset, but it's a marketing asset that people never throw away. They never throw that marketing asset away. People don't throw, let me, let me not say never, but they rarely throw them away. Like you get shunned for throwing books away. So a lot of times people donate books and they donate books and that book lives on and on and on and on. And your marketing asset, which is that book, you get more leads and more leads and more leads because you're donating that book. Second, to answer your question, uh, the leads are of better quality because these people have, they have the mindset of, I'm going to read. I'm going to read. I'm willing to invest in myself. I'm willing to sit down, invest time and actually read. Now, not everybody reads the book. Sometimes it's just a lead magnet, but yes, they are of better quality because what is a book? A book, it can be instructional. You can tell them whatever it is that you want to do. You can say, this is how you, this is how you best work with me. So a good example, this is how you work with Havana. You want to have this paperwork, this, 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 and this, and don't contact us until you have these things set up. But you have that marketing asset and you have those, you can put those instructions in there so people can come through and they are of better quality. So. Yeah, that's that's really cool to uh, mention that, and also the concept of the durability of your marketing. Um, you know, once your at once your Facebook ad dollars, you know, are spent, you know, that's not getting served up to people. You know, once your direct mail goes out and you don't do another round of it, you know, that that card, granted, you know, it got read, but it got recycled. 
hopefully recycle. We got one planet, people. Um, you know, it gets recycled. And, you know, again, durability of marketing, I think that's a really interesting thing that you mentioned is that, you know, and personally right now I am cleaning out a guest bedroom and, you know, I have, you know, my bookshelf in there and I haven't touched some of these books in 10 years, but I'm like, I'm not going to get rid of it. Uh, and I'm literally just kind of shuffling this bookshelf around. And I probably have been for the last 15, 20 years. Um, you know, am I going to read any of these books again? Probably not. I have some in there I hate and I still haven't gotten rid of them. Um, <laughs> so I definitely need to make a trip to Goodwill or my, uh, my local book, um, you know, like club or something and donate them. But that's a really interesting point that you have on, uh, again, the durable nature of a book and the fact that, you know, one person buys it and then, you know, it's kind of like that word of mouth, you know, you have a client that's been a client for 10 years, they mention to someone that they do what they do. And then, you know, you get a lead from that. It's, you know, it's almost like your word of the book is acting as its own word of mouth. You know, someone picks it up, you know, for 10 cents at a garage sale because like, you know, they were just out there thrifting around and like, oh, I invest in real estate. No, I'm always interested in reading something and boom, now you have somebody else that didn't even buy the book from you that's that's kind of coming into that funnel. So I would say that if anyone takes something away from this, you know, past the other great content that we've had, that's a that's a really cool aspect of this avenue of marketing for, you know, real estate or really anything else you're doing because uh, you know, the the concepts that you've mentioned, you know, it doesn't have to just be real estate. Granted, real estate is one of those things that you know, if you're not telling people about what you're doing, you're probably not selling what you're doing. You know, you're not you're not making those sales, you're not making money. Um because uh, I try to, and I always, I wish I remember who told me this. Uh, they said, if you're investing in real estate, the single worst thing you can do in investing in real estate is not tell people what you're doing. I, really, I wish I could credit that quote correctly because I don't want to take credit for it. But I, I love that because the, one of the worst things when anyone asks me that's new in real estate is, you know, how do I be successful? I'm like, tell everyone, be annoying about it. The worst thing you can do is be quiet about being investing in real estate because you will not make a dime if people don't know that you do what you do. Absolutely. And let me just, I, I mentioned a strategy, but let me add one more. And so imagine like we took that concept, like you're talking about, and you just get started in real estate and you document your journey every day. This is what I'm doing. This is how real estate is going. And you do it over a video and you have that video transcribed and you start to give that book out to people. This is how I got it started in real estate. It's a book as an asset and you can gift that to other people. One of the other strategies that I like to like emphasize is um, instead of just one book, you give two books. People like to give other people other things. So you give your that person two books here. This one is for you. And this is one is for somebody that you like. And people would be willing to give out more marketing for you. So there's so much. Nobody's going to give away your business card, but they'll give away one of your books. So it, it it's, it's so many powerful strategies. We only scrape the surface of like what you can do a book. With no, a book that's, that's so. another really interesting aspect of that is that, you know, for a minimal cost for you, you effectively have turned someone else into, you know, a, a vessel for being an ambassador of your marketing message. You know, it's, you know, that Facebook ad only shows up on that one person's Facebook uh, or that, you know, that direct mail goes to that one person's house. You know, I think most people would be a little bit peeved at someone if they gifted them a piece of direct mail. I think most right. of them should be like, really, this is what you gave me as a piece of junk mail? Thanks. Uh, but, you know, if someone gives, you know, you get an extra book and say, hey, you know, you're interested in what I did. You know, if someone's interested in real estate, you're not handing them a flyer for for real estate that you got, but you definitely would hand them a book. So, again, for kind of, you know, that, you know, effectiveness of your dollars and that throughput, I think that's a really good nugget that you mentioned is that, you know, the the marketing aspect of, you know, having something that someone can else can also then in turn give to someone else downstream to again increase the size of that funnel of the amount of leads that are coming into it so that way you can uh, whatever you're doing be more effective and get more out of the dollars that you spend um because again you mentioned you know be effective by spending you know fifty dollars a day roughly you know how can you maximize that roughly eighteen thousand dollars a year that's an awesome way, again, that I think that you you mentioned to do it. And again, just kind of scraping the service on all this. But, um, you know, I think we're kind of rounding third, heading home on this, um, you know, with regard to the time that we have. I'm sure we could, could sit and chat for hours about this. But, you know, Jerome, what would you say for someone listening to this that is, you know, again, you know, investing in real estate either, you know, maybe they've been, you know, we've kind of, I think, really covered the people that, 
you know, how coming into it, how do I market? What would you say to someone that is, you know, been in the business for 30 years that, you know, is looking for new avenues? What would you say to that person that maybe has, you know, some ingrained tendencies? Um, you know, what are some, what would you say to that person to try to, you know, help them improve what they're doing in this changing marketplace? Um, I would say uh, they, they are my favorite people because they have so much knowledge and expertise. And I, I would try to get them to apply the same strategy. I would, I would have them be willing to have a conversation with someone willing. Uh, I know a lot of times when you've been around for a while, you like to share your story. I would encourage them to be interviewed, to be interviewed. And I would encourage them to have that video transcribed and put in an interview format. And it doesn't have to be a book, step one, step two. It doesn't have to be like that. You can turn that book into uh, successful stories of, of 30 years of real estate investing. And that's a book that someone can appreciate and they can use. And it's also like the cool thing about like books is that it leaves your legacy. It leaves your legacy, the digital assets, the direct mail, the postcards, all that other stuff. It, it, it's not going to leave our legacy like a book will leave our legacy. So they probably have some grandchildren or some children or some people that they really care about. And that's a good way to leave your legacy as well. It doesn't have to just be real estate. Awesome. Yeah. Well, again, I think that's a good place to end it off on. Jerome, I really appreciate you uh, being on with us today. Uh, you know, I always appreciate everyone's time because, you know, we're talking about assets and what people have. And that's the one thing that you can't earn more of is time. So thank you very much for being with us today. Um, how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about this? Because um, I'm assuming that, you know, it's it's always good to, uh, you know, learn more about this. And that's part of the main theme of what we talked about today. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more or what else you have going on? Yeah, so I would encourage people, if you want to just reach out to me, like personally, I have a, I have a website, JeromeLewis.com. If you want to learn more about like how to apply like the book strategy and the book marketing to your business, my other website is ReMarketingBook.com, ReMarketingBook.com, and you can learn all about it. So, All right, Jerome. Well, thank you very much for being with us on, on with us today. I really appreciate everyone that's listening's time. And uh, if there's any other questions that you have for Jerome, please point it over there. I can always be reached at AdvantaIRA.com. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining and have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Tune in next week for more investing tips and strategies. Want to hear more episodes of the Alternative Investing Advantage? Search podcast at advantaira.com and subscribe.